Good afternoon, thank you for coming. If I could ask you to grab any drinks or snacks that you need now, put your phones on airplane mode. And I'm going to ask um, Priscilla Abba, one of our students, to introduce our guest today. Today we have the pleasure of listening to Mr. Bonanni Garuldi, an expert on cryptocurrencies. And today he is going to talk about how Bitcoins work and why they have become so relevant. Mr. Garuli graduated from Lewis University with a degree in management and later on developed a passion for cryptocurrencies, in particular the analysis and management of Bitcoins, Latecoin, Ethereum, Monero Dash. This led him to start his own company with the aim of protecting companies such as Google, Microsoft, Sorgente Group, L'Europeana from cyber attacks. In fact, Mr. Garuli is also a member of the Bitcoin Foundation that supports startups and investors by creating new crypto coins. It is a real fortune to have him, him today here in school, as many of us know of the existence of Bitcoins, but not many know what they are or how they work. Mr. Bonani is here to respond to our questions, so please feel free to ask any questions you might have. Let's welcome Mr. Bonanno, Bonanni Garuldi. Okay, thank you for coming, even with this such bad weather, such a bad day. Thank you to Ms. Camero for inviting me and all of you for coming. So the lecture will last about 30 minutes. We have a, like a look about the cryptocurrency and particularly the Bitcoins. So we can start because time is money. So who I am, as, uh, as she said, I have a bachelor degree in financial markets and since uh, 2012 I've been studying Bitcoin and altcoins. And I'm a member of the Bitcoin Foundation, which is like an organization that helps like people and the programmers and whatever to, how to say, join the Bitcoin world. I'm an advisor, and she, as she said, for um, many investors, some big companies could be like uh, Google, Microsoft, uh, Fiat. Uh, I work with uh, um, Italian University, with the Tribunale of Rome, um, and stuff like that. I started my own company a few years ago, and uh, I do Bitcoin forensics. So I work with the tribunals, uh, making like papers to track uh, the money and uh, to help people like uh, join in this world. So. So let's have a first look. So what is Bitcoin? Many of you probably already knew from uh, newspapers or something, they, you heard about it. But this is the technical definition taken from uh, Wikipedia. So Bitcoin is a digital currency. There are no bills to print or coins to mint. It's decentralized, there's no government institution, which could be like a bank or uh, whatever, or any authority that controls it. Owner anonymous, uh, we'll see better later. Instead of uh, names, uh, Security, social security number or whatever, Bitcoin connects the people with encryption keys. So keep in mind these five features of the Bitcoin that we'll see uh, later. So it's decentralized, it's digital and it's not virtual. A lot of people say it's virtual money. No, it's just digital because virtual is something that doesn't exist, while digital is exist but in a different form as this presentation is digital, it's not virtual. Then we have another feature which is very important. There is like uh, an endless future, which is immutability that we'll see later as well. Then there's the DC divisibility, which means that the Bitcoin can be divided in very, very, very small parts. Uh, so you can use it uh, like every day with no problem. And then the most important feature probably is the pseudonymity, sorry for my English, I don't know how to pronounce it that, which means that it's not anonymous and it's not like uh, public, it's something in the middle, but we'll see it later. This is just the five main features of the Bitcoin. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the first decentralized digital currency. Bitcoins are digital coins you can send through the internet. Compared to other alternatives, Bitcoins have a number of advantages. Bitcoins are transferred directly from person to person via the net, without going through a bank or clearinghouse. This means that the fees are much lower. You can use them in every country. Your account cannot be frozen, and there are no prerequisites or arbitrary limits. Let's look at how it works. Several currency exchanges exist where you can buy and sell Bitcoins for dollars, euros, and more. 
or your bitcoins are connected to your digital wallet on your computer or mobile device. Sending bitcoins is as simple as sending an email, and you can purchase anything with bitcoin. The bitcoin network is secured by individuals called miners. Miners are rewarded newly generated bitcoins for verifying transactions. After transactions are verified, they are recorded in a transparent public ledger. Bitcoin opens up a whole new platform for innovation. The software is completely open source and anyone can review the code. Bitcoin is changing finance the same way the web changed publishing. When everyone has access to a global market, great ideas flourish. Bitcoins are a great way for businesses to minimize transaction fees. It doesn't cost anything to start accepting them and it's easy to set up. There are no chargebacks and you'll get additional business from the Bitcoin economy. Okay. So after this video, we're going to explain this feature that we talked before. So the first one is very important, which is not centralized money. What does it mean? There's no institutional, there's no banks, there's no central banks or whatever that controls the Bitcoin. The Bitcoin are controlled by the community. So you just need two or more computers connected to the internet to make it work. So it's very hard for anyone to stop it or to block it because they should like block all the computers in the network which is like quite impossible. So all this information are holded by everyone in the network. So there's a public public file which is called the blockchain which is the system that we'll see later which is available for everyone. Then as we saw it's, it's digital which is not virtual as I say again. Do you remember like the music when it was on the like uh, how to say the old uh, disc and now it's in your iPhone? It's like the same stuff. The money is not in your wallet anymore. It's just digital money. So there's a like lower cost for money. You don't have to print the money. You don't have to store the money. You don't have to move that much money. So even safety problem could be like uh, avoided. So and that all the transaction and the wallets which holds and transfer the bitcoins are heavily encrypted. What does it mean? That just the owner of the, of the private key can like move the bitcoins. So no one can even steal your bitcoins. There are no banks that can like take care of your money because maybe they have like, I don't know, um, fiscal policy or whatever, like uh, government problems. So it's just about you. You are the real owner of your money. Then we saw the immutability, which is very important as well. And we saw that in the blockchain, which is like all the information about the wallets and the transaction, are like forever. Because there is like um, how to building a house block from block. And you cannot never go, go back. So every time you put some information on the blockchain, which could be like a transaction or wallet balance, it cannot ever be modified. So no one can ever modify it or say, like, oh, you had a problem, you had to give me back your money or something. There are no chargebacks, like it will happen with the credit cards or even bank transfer that you can, like, charge back in two days. So it's forever. Even in, like, 200,000 years, they will see the information of the bitcoins that we send today, everyone in the network. So, yeah, it will last forever as long as it will be the internet. And probably the internet now will be forever, I think, and I hope. So the blockchain and all this information will be forever as well. And then we talk about the divisibility. A lot of people asking me, OK, I want a Bitcoin, but should I have to buy just one Bitcoin, which is now like 9,000 euros? So the problem is that the Bitcoin can be like fractionated in very small amount. So with Bitcoins, it's even better than traditional money, because you can send even one cent on whatever you need. Even if you have to pay a coffee, you can pay with Bitcoins. You don't have to use one Bitcoin. But as you can see in the example, one euro like today is something like that. So the Bitcoin is very, how to say, flexible. And the pseudonymy, which is like uh, a lot of probably newspaper TV show will say that all the Bitcoin are used by bad people to like, I don't know, money laundering, uh, drugs uh, or whatever, which in some part is true, but is this, they will do it anyway with the like traditional money because they think that Bitcoins are totally anonymous, which we are not. They are a kind of anonymous. We're going to see it now. So any address which is the wallet have no name attached. So this is the anonymous part. It means that you register a Bitcoin wallet. You don't have to give them the ID or whatever. So it's technically anonymous. And uh, as we saw in the public register, which is the blockchain, all the transaction and all the balances are saved and are forever. And anyone can access it. So if you take money from anyone, you're going to show on the blockchain. This is one of the 
we call it block explorer, which are like websites as uh, like blockchain.info.com or whatever, there are a few on the internet. You can just go there and put a wallet or put a transaction and give you like all the history from the start of the Bitcoin till today. So it's like, it's not that anonymous as we can think, because at the end you're gonna follow the money and trace if you spend it like on Amazon or whatever, he, he will use it. So it's possible for everyone to know the balance of every wallet, to see all the transactions, even if they have no names. But you can follow the money or track the money, because as I work in the justice, most of the time to like, follow a crime, you need to follow the money. If you find the money, you find the, the solution, more or less. So how it started? The Bitcoin started like almost 10 years ago when uh, some guy who's like, uh, we don't know if he's a guy, a Japanese guy, uh, an American group, uh, just published um, um, a, a paper called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electric cash system. And the next year, he made the software, which is already in use, uh, which today we, we're still using. And it's completely open source, so anyone can just download the code if you have a, a bit of programming skill, you can check the code and see if there is any problem. Or There's no backdoor, there's no virus inside. It's like super open. So in the next year, these are like the, the key points on every year, more or less, for me. So in the 2011, Wikileaks was one of the first organizations to directly accept Bitcoins. In 2012, about 100, 1,000 of uh, online shops uh, were start uh, adding Bitcoins. In 2014, which is like four years ago, the US Commodity Trading Commission already knew the Bitcoins because uh, they listed the product. Because uh, like the newspaper started about two years ago, something like that, but they were already studying and using Bitcoin before going to uh, like the public. So in 2015, there were about uh, a lot of merchants start uh, accepting Bitcoin. So we came to this year, like 2016, the academic uh, interest about Bitcoins grew up so much. Uh, we saw in Google Scholar articles, which is like a big library of uh, articles made by students that you can like share, review, buy, whatever. They grow from 83 to 400, and then they grow up to 4,000, which is like uh, almost exponential. Even the software and the project made on GitHub. GitHub is like a platform where you can create a software and upload it to the community. So the community can review it, fix it, or say, okay, there's a problem and something like that. So they have more than 10,000 projects in 2017 involving the Bitcoins. So the volumes, of course, uh, skyrockets. And like in this year, there are like 162 million of active wallets. There are like 90,000, okay, there's a social, uh, social media tweets uh, per day, and there are about 8 million transactions per day. This is the average of the Bitcoin market, because as we saw, all the information are public, so it's very easy to know how much money is moving. Okay, and that's the, maybe the main question that everyone is asking to me usually, like how to buy, sell, and spend the cryptocurrency and the Bitcoin in particular. So the first way is the direct uh, way, I mean, person to person. I mean, if someone has the Bitcoins, uh, he can send it to you via yeah, like uh, an application on your mobile phone, on uh, App Store, there are a few, a lot of applications. So if I want to send money to my friend, we can just connect, meet in the bar, and I can sell them the money, or sell or spend. The other way that we talk about was about the exchanges. So if you don't have Bitcoins and you don't have a friend who has Bitcoin, there are like web exchanges. We are like websites, like a stock market, we can call it, or like, how to say, like a Craigslist of Bitcoins. When you can go there and say, okay, I need 10 euros of Bitcoin, they would say, okay, I'll send you the Bitcoins, you send me the 10 euros. You can send it by bank wire, you can meet in person, you can send even Amazon gift card, whatever. And like today, there are about 200 exchanges. These are the most famous. And you can change the Bitcoins in every value. So every, if you travel around the world, you don't have to take care about changing the money or whatever. It's just the exchange doing automatically, they convert the money in your currency that you need. That's why there are like 7,000 trading pairs, which means Bitcoin against Euro, Bitcoin against dollars, and like 7,000, which are like uh, quite a lot. Another way, which could be maybe the, the fastest way, is via the debit or the credit cards. Because there are a lot of companies that allow you to deposit cryptocurrency on credit cards. So they give you like a plastic card, and instead of putting the money, they put you the, the Bitcoin inside the credit card. 
So there, you go to a shop and you just use that credit card. And you can do the vice versa as well. I mean, you can buy the bitcoins with a credit card. But for that, you need the ID verification, because uh, the, the credit cards have the change back. So it's, for the company, it's not super safe to, to accept uh, credit cards. So what can you buy with them? After, that, after all of that, you can buy everything, because uh, it's just a matter how you spend it. You maybe find a coffee shop that directs accept uh, cryptocurrency, so you pay direct with your application. Or it could be like, I don't know, some business that accept cash, because you can change it at the exchange. Or every business that accepts credit cards. So how to use bitcoins, you can really use it everywhere in the world. It's like your credit card. If you can use credit card and cash, you can use the bitcoins. Because this is one of the questions that I got most. Like, what can I buy with them? How can I use them? OK, I buy them. Now what, what, what should I do? So probably the credit card is the easiest way to use it, because you just get a Visa, MasterCard, or whatever, and you go around, you go to the ATM, and boom, it's magically working. So now that you buy, you're trying to buy your Bitcoins, how can you store the Bitcoins? So we talk about the keys. So this wallet is not like a physical wallet that we have in our pockets. It's like a digital wallet, which is like made in two parts, with two keys, which is one public and one private. So the public key is like your Swift, uh, Swift code that you give to people to send money to your bank account. And it's public, of course. So you can give it to anyone. You can write it on your like, business card so people can send you the money. But when you need to send your money, you need the private key, which is like a password. It's like I said, like the bank token, or sometimes they send you the SMS for a verification, something like that. It's just a code. And the keys are like that one. So sometimes uh, it's not very, how to say, easy to remember the keys. So there are many ways uh, you can store the keys. So the first one is uh, online. You just sign up in a website. You put your email address and stuff. Uh, and they hold the keys for you. So they have your private, and they give you the public, so you can give it to your friends to get the money. So this is the easiest way, but probably it's the less safe. Because uh, you don't have the, well, you don't have the private key. So they have your own password. So theoretically, they can just send all your money, and then you have any control. It's like to be like banks today. Then you have an hardware wallet, which is like an USB card, which is very safe because the, um, your private key, which is your password, is held physically in a USB card, which you hold. So without that, you cannot send the money. You can just receive the money. It's harder to use because you have to start some software. So it's, it's not super easy. But it's not super hard as well. It's just the hardest. Another way is via the mobile phone, which is very used. Uh, especially young people are using that a lot. There are a lot of applications who makes you do that. You just download an application, and in your application, you have the public and the private key in the same application. So you just go around the world, and you can accept money and send money. I didn't put uh, like super safe, because sometimes people download too many apps on their mobile phone. So sometimes they can download a virus or something. They can try to steal the private key from the Bitcoin application. But this is just about you. I mean, if you use it, your mobile phone uh, good, it won't happen. But if you want to be paranoid as I am, it's not the, the best safest mode. The safest mode actually is this one. It's like a paper wallet. You just take one paper and you write uh, your private key or your password. So no one can physically access it. At least they like rob your house. This is not super uh, usable, because every time you have to spend it, you need the key. So if I'm here and my paper is uh, like in my home, I cannot send you the money. So, but it's super safe, because you can put it like in the safe, and no one ever can use that money. Because you know these keys are like quantistic keys, so it's impossible to replace, to find with any computer. No one can really find it. So watch out uh, when you like, use the paper, may you maybe, maybe some copies. Uh, because if you lost your paper, you lost all the money in the wallet, and there's no bank or government that can recover it. So as we told you, we say the, the four like, most used methods in the world to send the money, which are the bank wire, the credit card, the cash, and then the cryptocurrency. So we see who controls your money. So the banks is like centralized, because it's the like, banking system controlling your money. Then there's a credit card that put double centralized, because you have like the credit card company and the bank. And they both can stop you from using the card, so your money. The cash is centralized as well, because to get cash, you need to go to a bank, so you have to need an account or whatever. While the crypto are decentralized, so no one can really stop you from using your money. 
Now we have the payment speed, which could go like from one, two days for the bank transfer to the cryptocurrency, which are like very fast. They are not the instant as the credit card or like the cash, but for the cash, of course, you have to meet physically at some store, some place. While the fee are very low, of course, uh, the cash is, uh, is the lowest, but it's the very low security because in the cash you cannot get fake money or you can get robbed. Uh, sometimes it's like a black business working around the cash. And all these business work 24-7 uh, except the bank transfer. If you have to send money to your friend on Christmas, New Year's, whatever, you probably have to wait two or three days to, to get the money. So, but instead you got the security, which is very high for the bank, so it's very uh, um, difficult to steal money from the bank. If on the credit card, is medium, because sometimes they can close your credit card, which from the cash is the most risky way to spend money and to go around with a lot of cash in your pocket. Well, the crypto, as we saw, it's very high security, because you are the only one having the private key or the password. Okay, we go, you know, that's so. This is microeconomics. So how is different between the startup <coughs> economy and the crypto economy? So we, we speak about three things of the economy. We, the first one is the money supply. So the money supply is how much money is in the system, like how much dollars, how much euros are in the system. So as of today, there are about 5% of physical money in cash. So we can say that the euro, the dollar are already digital money, not 100% digital, but 95 or something. <coughs> And the money is given to the states via state loans or something, which is debt. And they, these are the guys who control the money supply, which is like the former Yellen, Draghi, and whatever. So they can just do like economic war, political war, or whatever. They think the economy is not going good, so they can push the money in the system, and they can throw out money in the system. While in the crypto world, the money supply is fixed, so no one can change it. So you know already in 2050 how much bitcoins will it be. And the cap, as we can see, will be 21 bi million bitcoins. At 21 million, there will be no more bitcoins uh, getting in the system. So the inflation is fixed. It's not like uh, the real world where like, the money supply can uh, to say, modify the inflation and the deflation. Because the money value or the money of everything is how much you can find it. Why gold is so value? Because there's not much gold. If we find a lot of gold, like, I don't know, in the sky falling down, the price of gold will go down because everyone will buy the gold. So in the traditional system, there are like the central banks, uh, the Fed, the BCE, the Bank of China, who controls uh, the value of the money. So they decide how you should be rich or poor. And they are fighting each other. Like now, they are fighting Japan against the USA. That's like, how to say, monetary fight. And we are getting like the damage of that because our money is getting lower value. I mean, today you can buy this, and tomorrow probably you buy this smaller. And in the crypto markets, just the worldwide market is demand and offer. So there's no one, no third entity who decides how much money is in the system, how money is in value. And the regulation, the regulation is very similar because as we see in uh, especially Italy, which is very complicated, even city by city, they have different taxes. Uh, different rules, uh, even the US, like from the federal tax uh, or whatever. So this is very, how to say, difficult uh, system yet, because every country, as you saw in the map, the red is the um, countries banning bitcoins. So the orange are the countries who already regulated bitcoins, and the yellow are the countries that are studying how to regulate bitcoins, which are the most. Uh, if the world will find, uh, like I say, a global regulation will be much more better. Because yet there are almost no taxes on Bitcoin. Just in South Korea, they have like 23% of taxes. All the other world, there's no taxes on Bitcoin. So the government wants to, you know, getting in and say, okay, you can use it, but give me, give me some taxes, as always. Okay. As you can see, the Bitcoin price, I went over the years, I put the 3 of March of every year. So this was the price when it started in 2012, which was like $2.00. $100, $400 to today, which is like almost 10,000 on the 3 of March, because today is a bit lower. So as you see in the, in the small picture, like in the 2012, you maybe buy a Coke, and maybe in 2020, you buy a good car, a speed car with, a, the, with Bitcoin, because the price is just the market price. So more people buying Bitcoins, and the price is going to go up, because the money supply, as we told, it's limited. And this is a five-year chart, which is kind of impressive about the volumes as well. So like today, there's an average about 8 million transactions per day with about 5 billion USD per day. Oh, there's a mis 
at night school. And then the, the volume. So with the volume, you can almost find which country are using that most. And we see Japan is the country that most use bitcoins, or maybe most people convert it into yen. So it could be for speculation or whatever, but Japan is really the country and Asia who's moving, because we don't have uh, numbers about China, because China is a big player, but all the information about China are private, they're not public, so they want to give you like a fake number. But the biggest exchanges, these are the people moving the Bitcoin world, which is the Japan, the America, the Euro, and then it is the South Korean, this is the Korean one. Because it's Korean, they love Bitcoins. Okay, so behind the Bitcoins, there's a, there's a system, which is the most important thing probably, more than the Bitcoin itself, which is the blockchain. The blockchain is what we talked before, it's just a, a digital ledger of information that can store everything. This is the definition from a very interesting book, which is the blockchain revolution. And the blockchain has this characteristic, which is a distributed database. As we see, there's no one in the database, but everyone on the internet has the database. Has no single point of failure, because it cannot be modified, as we saw immutability. You cannot go back and modify something in the, in the past. It's super solid because there are a lot of people you have to take down like uh, millions of computers to make the blockchain down so since it's the beginning not even one second of downtime, time which is like uh, quite impressive and then it's transparent uh, it's public as we say it's unmodifiable or incorruptible and it's encrypted because all the transactions going to the blockchain are by the private key that we saw before or the password Ora vediamo, now we see a small video about the blockchain. So the potential of the blockchain is like endless. Can you imagine like not having like an ID, don't have a wallet, don't have the, the keys of your house, but just having everything in the blockchain? Because you have this private code, which is like your password, with, which can be like from your fingerprint to your eye, and you can use it for everything. So you can imagine how much like money, all the system, and like you don't have to bring anything when you go out. You just need your mobile phone with your key, and then you have all the, uh, your, uh, how to say, signature, you can have your birth certificate, your passport, uh, your IDs, uh, your money, your hotel keys, whatever you need. So there is a lot of way you can use it, and it's like unique, uh, so it's no one can even replace it. So with that code, uh, I mean, you can access to like all your life and all your services, and you can check in the past uh, whenever you are in the world. You just need like uh, an internet connection. 
So this is uh, like a lot of application are like using like now the blockchain from the medical to like taxes. Uh, so they can like start storing the information in the blockchain. There, there will be no like uh, public library. There will no be like uh, misuse. You cannot steal the, the, the stuff or whatever. So this probably will be like, I don't know, in a hundred, maybe 200 years, but like we don't, won't have like uh, keys of uh, our house anymore, even car keys, because the car is registered to us on the blockchain. So it needs like our password to open and to use it. So no one can really steal it. And if they steal it, the blockchain probably will track it because you're going to park like in a garage with the access connected to the blockchain. They will not say, OK, this car shouldn't be there. So even like something like uh, the security of the people will be like a, a lot better. So even a lot of things that are intangible, like coupons, patent, voucher, or whatever, cinema tickets, they will just be meshed with your blockchain account, with your blockchain, I would say, life. Yes, account is good. So this is like the way maybe these guys who are younger will see that. And one day they will just go out with that with no wallet and nothing. And their life will be here. No one can steal it. Even if they steal your mobile, they won't have like your eye or your fingerprint. So for, um, for concluding, we speak about the altcoins. <coughs> altcoins are nothing that Bitcoin alternatives. Because the Bitcoin that we saw started like 10 years ago. So it's. I don't want to say it's an old technology already, but they weren't, uh, it wasn't ready for too many people to use it. So all the altcoins are like coins that pretend to improve uh, the Bitcoin uh, features or component. As we can see, there are like about 1.5 thousand of uh, altcoins. And this is like a coin market cap, which is very famous website. They're listing, these are the top 15. I don't know if you can read it. They're like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, Bitcoin Cash, and, and so on. Because the Bitcoin has a problem now with the transaction. Of course, too many people are using them. So the transactions are getting slower, which is not like useful if you have to buy coffee and make the guy wait like three minutes for the money credited. So these new Bitcoins, so Bitcoin 2.0, they have like bigger memory. They have maybe money supply. It's bigger. And they have like hashing algorithm, which are like the keys that are faster than the original Bitcoin. Because the original Bitcoin was like, how to say, a experimental project. And now at the end, there are like 200 millions maybe of people using it every day. So the system is quite, it's like you build a house and then so many people got inside. So the next time you say, OK, let's build another house. Because as we saw, it's not possible to go back. So you cannot modify the Bitcoins, because the blockchain is forever. So you just have to create another one. But the Bitcoin world will be like this forever, which is good and bad, I mean. OK, so in all these currencies, these are some of the most famous, which was the first three, which maybe you heard about it, which are Ethereum, of course, to the Bitcoin, and the Ripple. And we're going to see uh, the main uh, features of them and the main problems that Bitcoin has. So it's the scalability, the transaction speed, uh, and the total supply. So the scalability is like how many transactions per second, TPS, uh, they can do in a block. The block is just uh, the piece of information of the blockchain. Imagine like building a block. Every block has three to seven transactions per second, which are not that much for today, while the Ethereum has few very smaller blocks and like twice or three times the the transaction per second of Bitcoin, while the ripple is like super fast. The ripple is like immediately. When you split send it, the guy already has the money. So the time for getting your Bitcoin now is 10 to 30 minutes, which is a lot, uh, while the Ethereum is one, two minutes, uh, while the ripple is like three or four seconds. But this is like one of the worst cases. Uh, I wasn't optimistic when I did that. But as you maybe read the newspaper or something, you probably heard about Ethereum and Bitcoin, but not about Ripple, because Ripple was developed for the banks, because uh, the banks are exchanging a lot of money between them, even if we don't see them, even on Sunday and Saturday. And this mechanism, which is the SWIFT, is very complicated, and it costs them a lot about, like, even from the computers holding all that information from like uh, banks that are closing time zones or whatever. So they build like this ripple who can help them to, to move all our money. Um, while the other two, the Ethereum and the Bitcoins, are, are really like for, for everyone. And another important thing is, as you see, the Ethereum has no cap. Because uh, Ethereum is maybe, it will become like the Bitcoin of the future. Because there's uh, no cap on the supply, which is dynamic. So more people are getting in, and more supply is going to get in, but with a formula. 
So there will not be like uh, much inflation as the Bitcoin, because as you saw in the graphic before, Bitcoin goes up and down very quick. Uh, so like today, you maybe have 10 euros in your wallet, and tomorrow you have 8 euros. The other day, you have 14 euros. So it's not very good for like everyday spending, because you go out with some money, and then maybe you go to the movie theater, and you don't have that much money anymore. Or maybe you can buy two tickets. So we don't want that for the, like, um, for the everyday money. Quanto abbiamo fatto? Ok. So, thanks for your attention. I did it like five minutes later. So if you have any questions, sorry it was intense, a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff, but this is like a, a small peak of, uh, of this world, which is like, uh, for me it's very interesting. It probably will be the future for all these guys uh, in maybe two years, ten years, I don't know. Maybe one day we don't have euros or dollars anymore in our pocket, but just digital money that we really, really control it. Ben, if you have any question or whatever, don't be shy, because... You can see the evolution of Bitcoin, how it raises, you know, the price level, it's like a roller coaster. Yeah. And you kind of mentioned it's a demand and supply issue, but the changes are so drastic compared yeah. to today. Yeah. What is driving the value right now? Yeah, you go up like 40%, 80%, 100% in a day. Because technically, even if it looks big and this number compared to the real economy, it's nothing. It's like, uh, how to say, a small flower in a forest. Mm -hmm. So technically, it's just demand and offer. The problem is sometimes they enter like big banks or governments or someone may be selling. Like last day, they sell like 400 million in one order. So the market crashed down. Because the market is still in, in, how to say, in a new phase, so it's not very stable. Because mm -hmm. all the market value is just about, uh, how to say, 200 billion, maybe. So it's, it's a lot for us. It means, seems a lot. But for the financial market, it's not a lot. So it's very, how to say, speculative now to invest in bitcoins. I mean, if you're doing like a daily trading, it's, yeah, you need to like hold and don't look at it. But if you think about the future, the potential, like in five years or 10 years, it will grow for sure, because that will be the future. Now it's like a small boat, we say, a small boat in the ocean. So when it comes away, it can boom, going down, and then it goes up. So other coins like Ethereum should be more stable because they have the scalability. But even then, if like some big bank or some government try to track them down, it's still like a small boat in the, in the ocean. So as now, it's, you have to invest in the long term. Because if you see today, it's like 15% up, tomorrow it's 30% down. Because the marketing is like, it's like a baby who's born, how to say, who is about to grow up. So it's not stable yet. And in the last year, we saw like the price from 1,000 to almost 10,000. So it's whatever, it's, it's a lot. And it goes up to 20,000. And we see the peak in 1996, which was a lot. Like, and it keeps going up. And then he fall down like 70%. Now it's going up. So it's, it's crumbling, we say. But just because the market is very small yet compared to the financial market. So when JP Morgan gets in, Bank of America goes in, uh, even if they buy or they sell, they're going up and down. And now they have like a Bitcoin future on the Nasdaq, uh, on investing.com, it's um, online. So they are like institutional, uh, mm, how to say, institutional companies getting in, which they are like whales uh, and they have tons of money. So if you, they just do that, uh, they could go down or up. And sometimes about the regulation, like, okay, China banned Bitcoin, so it goes down. And then I don't know, Visa accepting Bitcoins and it goes up. But technically, it's just demand and offer. There's no third party who can like, modify it and say, OK, let's put more Bitcoin to make it stable. No, there are 21 big million Bitcoins will be, and that's it. So it's just maybe big players, but it's still human. Maybe there are computers trading. But the problem is there are more people using it and more like institutional, big financial, like hedge funds. And they go then, I mean, 
like in 2011, the, the, you know, the spread between Italy and Boons skyrocketed like 500% in like one month. So, so if they can manipulate like two markets, Germany and Italy, Bitcoin is like nothing for them. So. Yeah. This is another issue because if the taxes everywhere, then the money will uh, will be less less. Yeah, it's like how to say it's like money from buying to selling. So it's like uh, how to say profit. It's like here in Europe, like in Italy, it's like twenty-seven percent. But in Korea, they made a regulation as well. See, in the U.S. they are studying, they are studying the regulation. So this is a problem because when they will make a regulation, yeah, maybe the, the tax will be so high and nobody will use any more. Yeah, yeah, it's so like a, true. yeah, yeah, it's true. But it's something in the middle because when you say a regulated market, you say okay, so I trust the market because you say there's the government, so everything is like super clear. They protect me in somehow. Okay, I'll pay taxes. But when you feel regulated, you probably feel more safe to invest your money. If it's unregulated market, you say, I don't know, maybe I lose the money, maybe the money goes down. Technically, nothing will change. But the problem is the government wants to, to, to have a piece of that. But the problem is that the Bitcoin can move all around the world. And for sure, you'll find a country who will be like Mexico and Canada and say, OK, for me, it's no taxes. Like today, the, the fiscal paradise, like Gibraltar, Luxembourg, or Dublin, or Holland. Because the freedom of the country, you always find the country that would say, OK, take the money from me, like Switzerland, whatever. That's, that's few. So the regulation is something very difficult, because uh, it could be good or could be bad. That brings me to the point. I thought part of Bitcoin was people didn't want regulation. They want you know, transactions, peer to peer, yeah. and, think, and, and avoid the regulator. Um, we've seen the success regulators have had you know, in, in the past. So assurance, not really that much if, if yeah. the system is fail safe. Yeah, like, and it's even difficult to trace the Bitcoins. Because as we saw, if you don't spend it, uh, they are just anonymous wallets. You just get. Yes. Like, uh, whoa, 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 whoa. The rest so out. how can they tax it if you will spend it for a year? They are, now they are taxing companies because uh, okay. they have to put on the balance sheet. Like we bought, I don't know, hundred thousand. We sold at two hundred thousand, so you get tax on the profit. Uh, but for people, for me, technically, it's not easy because you get a list of all of that. Like this guy sent money to another guy, but who's the first guy? Who's the second guy? So till you cash out in some banks, uh, they won't find you, and it's very easy to find the price on how you buy it. Because it's, you can move it, uh, you can change it. You can buy the bitcoins, then you change to Ethereum, you change to Ripple, then you change to dollars again. So technically, I think it will be a big problem for them to, even sometimes when I work with the justice to trace this money, sometimes you get lost because they made so many transactions. Uh, and it's like, they want to be, but technically, I mean, <laughs> it won't be very easy for them. As they are very good, but. This was made to make the free money without control. So, but they try. I mean, that's their job to, because a lot of people lose a lot of money. So they maybe and say, but they should know that it's not very stable before investing the money. Mm -hmm. So the regulation for something will probably try to protect you. I don't know what, how, because they won't give your money back. Even if they regulate it, you pay the taxes, they don't give you back nothing for sure. That's, that's how it works. Let's try go. <laughs> yeah. It's it's already a currency. It's just a currency, I'd say pseudonymous, uh, and it's free to the people that no one controls. It's just you and your private key. So even if they, I don't know, something bad could happen to you, which I don't hope. Uh, you are just the only one controlling your money. Even if you have your money at the Cayman, they can, like, I don't know, the government say, OK, all the money from foreign people, it's out from today, from tomorrow. So the difference is just this, that you really control the money. Like, see what's happening in like, a country like, I don't know, South uh, Latin America, Venezuela, when the states say, OK, from tomorrow, oh, what's happened to India? OK, from tomorrow, this bill is not legal. We, OK, introduce another money, so you lose, like, 90% of your value. Or like a draggy say, OK, tomorrow we're going like, to give more euros to the, like, how to say, to the di country in difficult. So your money, today you can buy a water. Tomorrow you buy a smaller water. 
so you have to work more to get the same money, you know, that's, that's the inflation. So at least with that, it's smart control and it's just you who have really control of your money. So. It's like a rule to the people. It's like, yeah, it's like this money was to make some currency that's not control on anyone. That you can just go around the world and use it with no one who can like follow you or trace you or whatever. So they say that a lot of bad activities legal are doing with that. But actually with the cash, they did it for like 2,000 years. So if the human being wants to do something, it just find another way. So it's, the, and the cash is the first thing so which is doing for illegal trades or whatever. So it's like, yes, it started with a new way, like a digital currency. We have the internet now, so we have to use the internet because we are connected all again by the same cable. I mean, we are on the same cable, anyone in this room in the city. So it's, we have to use this potential, not just for, and you don't pay the fees, uh, you can use it every day as we saw, and you have all the characteristics that the cryptocurrency has compared to the, like to say, real money. And you can change crypto to pounds, crypto to euros, so you don't have like uh, interest rate between one and them, you don't pay the fee when you go to the transfer, or if you go to another state, you don't have to change your money, go to the ATM or pay the credit card fee, whatever. You just have... <laughs> Yeah. On the other side, I'm wondering, does the future of just once it's regulated? Yeah, we'll see, we'll see, because technical governments are finding a lot of difficult to regulate it. That even the US government is trying so bad, but they're giving like papers to the people and say, okay, you have to fill that form and tell me how much you did. Because technically, it's very hard to. To, to control it, yeah, to track it. So it's, yeah, it was born as like a free money. But then anyone say, okay, I want the free money, I want my money, I don't want people to know where I'm sending the money. If I send a bank transfer to you, even say, okay, birthday present, uh, like, I don't know, 1,000 euro, they would say maybe one day, why did you send her 1,000 euro? What she did she did with that? Uh, so people don't want to do that, because now everyone knows everything about us, you know. Google knows everything. They know that we are here, they know everything. So people want to say, okay, I want the internet, but I don't want them inside my life too much. All the, and they send all the information for advertising. When you go to any website, they know you're, you better than, than us, probably, than yourself, because they know what time of the day you wake up, uh, which is your, I don't know, paintbrush, they know everything. And they use it against you, we can say, because they, they sell it to other like, advertisers, so it's, this is like a bit more anonymous, but yeah, it's like uh, opposing the system. It's like the freedom against like, the, the regulation or something, so it's, it's kind of fight between like... Uh, I don't know if they exist, but probably the solution is that the governments will adopt this. So like there's a, like Estonia, Venezuela, the, maybe India is trying, they, they did their own crypto money like the petrodollar or the S-coin, which I collaborated with. So they say, okay, we use that, but we control that. So when you give it to you, you give us the ID. So they use the system, the blockchain or whatever, but they know who is the owner of any wallets. So that's maybe how it's gonna go. So um, S-coin is very interesting and they, they have a very, very good project. Estonia, they are very, how to say, innovative people. Venezuela did it just to, to skip the embargo. And they did it, they saw like seven billions in two days. So they say, okay, we do the petrodollars. Okay, and everyone from the world just send bitcoins in exchange of this petrodollar. So they get the bitcoins and then they can respend it and buy stuff from the world without, without using the dollars, which is too much for the state. So that could be maybe the future. But they understand that we don't need banks anymore. We don't need the fees anymore. We don't need like a lot of stuff that we have today, and, like the wallet. We cannot lose the wallet if we don't have it. I mean, we just have the mobile phone, that's it. That's all we need. So it will be easier, and everything is recorded. So no more black money, even if you pay a coffee, there's no need of receipt, there's blockchain. I go to the, um, to the coffee we will shop a wallet, and I see all the transactions in the month, and he pay taxes on that. And he buys the coffee, so we see everything on the blockchain as well. So the government will earn much more taxes for sure. Because everything is public, recorded forever. And there's no way to like black market or something. 
if we send money to that. Uh, even if you buy on eBay or like, you know, I don't know, a clothes in some local shop uh, and you pay with bitcoins, it's tracked. So it's, yeah, it's not super easy, but it's, it's quite interesting because probably that will be the future. That's why the governments are trying to study that because they see the potential. But the banking system is say no because they are losing their, their power. They don't need banks anymore. So all, a lot of employees not needed. A lot of like computer system that transact money will be like useless. Because anyone who has a mobile phone has, uh, is one of the, of the blockchain, I would say, keeping the blockchain up. So it's not needed on anyone. And they cannot take it down. So that's very futuristic or whatever. But we're close, I mean, getting close. Yeah. Yeah. You said it's a digital money system, all digital. Therefore, where are the risks of hacking things all the time versus being hacked? Because it's basically created digitally, where are the risks of people hacking the system before the trade? And why not make the true, true market system? Why not allow supply to be demanded at the currency? Because you might know the demand is going up, which is driving up the prices. Why not? Why not yeah, technically it's like not super free, it's like a perfect market because when they introduced the software in 2009, they already said how much will be the supply. And as long as there are two or more people using it, you cannot change the software. You have to invent another currency, which are like Ethereum. So the total supply, like uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, or if we want to create a coin, like I don't know, Mary Mount coin, we say, okay, the supply will be 10 million, and we already knew in which year the supply will reach the limit. And once we start using it, we cannot modify it. So if you use Bitcoin, you know that that will be the maximum money supply. And this was decided at the beginning when they made the software. So if you want to change the Bitcoin, you have to create another coin, which you can call whatever you, you say. And uh, the other question about the hacking, yeah, it's like, um, that's why the online wallets are, like, are not very safe, because if they have your private key, which is your password, they can steal all your money, and no one can give it back to you. So that's why I take care about storing Bitcoin in a safe way, because uh, if they steal it from you, there's no one who can help you recover them. So as now as they steal, uh, maybe your, how to say, bank credential, but there, yes, you have an third institution, so maybe the bank will stop it because they will say proud or something. But if they clone your credit cards, probably if you don't have insurance, you won't get all your money back. So it's just a matter how you store your password. The problem is this word that you are the only one having the password. I mean, you can give it to your parents, to your girlfriend, whatever. But if you lost the password, someone steals the password, they can have all your money. And they can be anywhere in the world. And no one can like, give it back to you. So that's why you have to be very, very careful uh, about how you, you have your keys. Of course, you don't have it online or something like computer. That's why I always suggest do it paper or hardware wallet. Because paper, it's super hard to, to, to hack, almost impossible. It's just that useful that every time you have to copy. But they made the QR code, as you see here. So you don't have to give someone all the, the key, but you just have the QR code. So with the mobile phone and the camera, they get just read the, from the QR code, they read the, the key and the payments go through. So, but security is very, it's very important because there's no one, because the money is yours. So it's, there's no banks you go there, okay, they steal my account, but that happened as well. I mean, it's just here, it's just a bit more dangerous because you have no backup. Your backup is yourself, but it's your own money, so you should take care about, uh, about your own money. I was wondering about the limit that uh, uh, this gentleman talked about. Um, what I never understood about it was how they started to be created. I mean, if I now make up a coin, and then I just say, okay, I just, uh, in, in a digital form, whatever, I create 10,000 of these, and then I tell everyone, give me your money because I give you my coin. 
But there is no value behind it. I mean, it's just made up, isn't it? Yeah, the value is the user. More people are using it, the more it's value. The Bitcoin starts with like two guys or maybe three guys say, okay, let's make a coin like me and you. And we create, I don't know, for our wallets, 10 <coughs> coins. Then we see each one who supports the code, I mean, who has our software. So it keeps the network up, we give it some coins to them. And then from this, from three people to, to three person, 10 person, and then they grow up. And the value is just how many people are using it. But at the beginning, there's no technical value. So when they start the new coins, they already say, okay, like my city, my university, my business, or whatever, they are gonna use it. So if someone uses it, they, that's, the, that's the value. So if people can like change it to euros to, through the exchanges, or can use it to buy real things, uh, that's the value. But theoretically, as you said, there's no value. The value is the people using it. Yes, it sounds to me like one of these pyramid systems, you know? So the people that are coming uh, at the, from the bottom, are giving money to the ones on the top, and they created it and, and get all the credits. Yeah, just people supporting the community. And they were paid by Bitcoins. And then there were a lot of more people, because as the supply is limited, and a lot of people getting in, the price went up. But just because there are people who are willing to buy at 9,000, so it's just perfect market, so there's no real price. But even our euros or our dollars are legal tender. There's no gold, there's nothing behind that. So it's just, okay, some guys say, okay, 10 euros, you can buy five coffees, whatever. So it, it's already like paper. And why it's value? Because there's trust between the people. Mm -hmm. So there's trust, but there's nothing behind the euro. You cannot go to the bank and say, okay, I give you dollars, you give me gold. They won't do that. <laughs> so it's just because we trust each other. But if anyone goes to the bank, everyone, the system will collapse. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of trust. And here is almost the same. So people were rewarded by using their software with coins, which are like the ICOs and stuff like that that you probably read it. So they go to a university and say, okay, use my coins for like, I don't know, food supply. And then when you begin selling these coins, you say, okay, I have already 1,000 people using that. So they say, okay, maybe it's interesting. I buy some, and you buy at a higher price because it's limited. And then the money goes around, and that's how it grows from like one person to 200 million. So it's just demand and offer. But technically, yes, there's nothing behind it as the real money. I think we need to make this the last question, and then Mr. Chistari is going to come up with Hi, Julia. Um, I was just wondering uh, if, in addition to the most uh, simple and, and bound way to get a profit from uh, this technology, uh, I mean, um, through a simple trading job. Um, is there any other um, opportunity in the in a optimistic uh, in the optimistic scenario you are uh, forecasting in terms of uh, occupation, in terms of um, any other form to to get the profit? out of the sample uh, uh, trading because um, as some other guys yeah. already told uh, if, if you want to, to make profit by trading this is not the uh, very risky yeah it's super I, risky I, I won't I do it trading but I've never bought one Bitcoin <laughs> I so I was just wondering could I um, learn something more to take advantage from the blockchain to, to build a company, to build my professional skills and obtain some gains in a different way yeah. out of the trade? Out of the trade. Yeah, you should start. There are a lot of companies that start using the blockchain. So the developer tools for like engineers or for traders, for banks, whatever. So you have just to open a company or a business that use the potential of the mm -hmm. blockchain. So it could be the health system from the public government system, from the taxi system. There are a lot of like startups and companies growing up on the blockchain, not on the bitcoins, the blockchain. Yeah. Even like this library can have all the books on the blockchain. So when you rent a book, you, you give the blockchain idea of you. So I know when you get the book, uh, if you give it back and whatever. So you can start even a company like, I don't know, libraries, blockchain libraries, maybe. 
So you get all the books and all the people using uh, the, li the libraries in Rome, whatever. But the business about the blockchain, not the bitcoins. Because uh, bitcoins is mostly like investing. It can, it's, like, it's another way of setting money, but that's not going like, to be a new business. If you want to start up a company, you have to use the blockchain in some way. And like healthcare, there's super potential problem. It's like hospitals, uh, medicine, pharmacy, like everything. There's a lot of stock, and you have to, to trace it. Medicine, uh, whatever. There's IDs. There's there's a whole world of uh, hotel rooms, or whatever. It's it's a big world. It's the, just the world we are today, and we just digitalize it. Wow. So, uh, that's a yeah, obviously, on behalf of the Marymount community, we thank you for joining us tonight. That's it's a post Bitcoin. Obviously, the number of questions that you have received uh, post the show, there is a lot of curiosity about it. And it's, I guess I mean, I'm a bit skeptical, but the reality is, as right now, the few markets are turning to me, it's worth $10,000. So <laughs> it's the reality, it's worth something. It's nobody's closing, nobody's closing it. So um, I'd like to give you uh, thank you once again for joining us this evening.